The scripture for today is going to come from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 27. For I have received from the Lord that which I have delivered to you. same manner he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death till he comes therefore whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the blood the body and blood of the lord Sunday morning. You could have chose to be there. You could have chose to stay in your bed. You could have chose to go grocery shopping, go for a walk. There's a lot of popular things that are done on Sundays, and I'm glad that you chose to be here. I know God is glad that you chose to be here. You know, I am, um, you don't know this about me, uh, I'm still saying it now. And you know this, let me reiterate. I don't preach holiday sermons. But I do preach holiday sermons. I know that that is. On the Sunday, the first day of the week. In those three days, he has established the kingdom, and that is going to be proclaimed the day of Pentecost. And in doing so, we're going to have the accounting of the church. Now, with that being said, this is not something that should be relegated to one day uh, that we celebrate once a week or one day that we celebrate once a year, but this is a daily thing that we should have in our minds. The fact that Jesus Christ came and lived a perfect life, died a perfect death, and he resurrected, and now he is sitting. Uh, the right hand of God, uh, they are there reigning in heaven. And as we consider that, we should really have this at the forefront of our minds often, every single day. I mean, uh, what Christ has done and what it means to you will carry on throughout the rest of this year and forevermore. What about consider Easter? I think about uh, what most people commonly do. Um, they will question and wonder what exactly is Easter? What does that come from? What's this bunny got to do with anything? So they go to Google and they open it up and they type in Easter or what is Easter? And if they type in that, they get some type of answer. And then they go with that. Maybe they go and they talk to the preacher or the elders. They go and talk to someone who's religious. And they say, what does Easter have to do with God? And what does Easter uh, mention or where does it mention in the scriptures and so on and so forth? You know, this happens a lot in religious conversation. When you're talking to someone about biblical things, it's very important that you get biblical answers for what people are talking about. Sometimes and most times when we have a disconnect with our religious friends is whenever we aren't properly understanding what people want to talk about. We're using the same words, we're saying similar things, but we're not meeting the same thing. The reason why is because we don't properly define the things that we're talking about. Whenever you're using words and you're making reference to religious things and you're making reference to the way that you worship and why you worship the way that you do, why you commune when you commune, why you give with the fertility, why you sing, why you pray the way that you pray when you're talking about those things, and someone of the religious world is discussing it with you, they may question why do we do things so differently? I believe the reason why we do things so differently is because we don't know. Maybe they don't know what the Bible has to say about that. And maybe we define things differently. So it's important to stop and say, hey, 
Could you define that? What exactly do you mean by what you just said? How does that apply? What does this mean? If I was, this morning, I want to take a look at um, three different ways. We can define and understand and know exactly what they mean when we're talking to someone about religious matters. And these are three things that always come up. I know these things are going to seem simple, but this is where you need to start. Uh, instead of jumping to Z and talking about things that are like, you know, Holy Spirit and angels and so on and so forth, this is where you need to start on talking to people about being saved. Number one. How do you define that? I want to talk about the literal definition of baptism. I'm not just talking about uh, what baptism is going to do for us. We'll get into that as well. But just the basics of understanding baptism. One thing that commonly happens when talking to people about baptism is that we get on the same spiritual side of things. We talk about salvation. We talk about being saved and what baptism can do and wash away your sin. All of those things are important. But then we get to the very, very base understanding of baptism, and there's a disconnect. But we can get to the understanding of what Christ did for us and his dying for us. We can get to the understanding of the fact that we need to have this for salvation, but then we will disagree on something as simple as what the word actually means. The word baptism is defined as to dip repeatedly, to immerse, to submerge of a vessel, so to cleanse by dipping or submerging, to wash, to make clean water, to wash oneself, bathe, to overwhelm. <laughs> baptism is. Immersion. Whenever we look at the scriptures, we see Paul and others talking about baptism, and in doing so, they see it as holy. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, we'll look at verses 3 and 4. Now, again, I know that baptism is what brings salvation. I know that baptism was, is, what going, is what is going to wash away our sins and the means by which our sins are washed away. Baptism is going to be us being baptized into water and coming in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing us of our sins. We'll talk about that more in a second, verse 3, verse 21. But baptism literally means to be immersed in water. In the first century, whenever someone said the word for baptism to another, they literally were saying, you need to be immersed in water. It's not a sprinkling, this is not a pouring. And you notice this by the way in which it's described. In Romans chapter 6, Paul has worked his way up to convincing everyone that they need to be baptized. So in Romans chapter 3, lets everybody know that they have sin. In chapter 2, he's saying the difference between Jews and Gentiles and the law that they follow. But nonetheless, they have those fallen laws uh, to God and both are responsible to him. They all have sin. And so he finally gets to chapter 6 and he says, now that you guys have realized that you have sin and that you need to be baptized for your sins and are, just know that you weren't baptized if you could continue sinning so that God's grace has been found. You were baptized to wash those sins away completely and to become something new. But notice the definition that he gives for baptism, even in this very message, this very scripture. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. It says, Do you not know that as many as you who were baptized, many of us who uh, were baptized into Christ, Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were very, very convinced. Uh, through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead uh, by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in this life. Paul says that baptism is a burial. Baptism is a complete covering of. Maybe, maybe this is not where my mind should go, but I think about uh, when I pass away. And when I pass away, Shelby is there at the grave side. And, I'm being buried, I'm in the coffin, and they have me lower down in the hole, and I've been lower down the hole. A couple of people who are working there who's going to bury me, they walk across um, the graveyard, and they, they go over to the side of the big mound of dirt, and they give them a handful of dirt, and they walk over, and they sprinkle it all across the casket, and they say, all right, uh, we'll see you later. So we said, what is that? It's how we're just completing the burials. That's not a burial. That's just you sprinkling some dirt on him. They said, well, okay, well, how about this? They walk over there, they grab a cup of dirt, they give them a cup of dirt, they walk over and they pour that in the hole on top of the casket. I said, well, that is a burial. This is why it's important when talking about baptism to have a conversation about what the word actually means. Some will teach that baptism is nothing more than a sprinkling of water to cleanse the soul. Some will teach that baptism is nothing more than a pouring on of water to cleanse the soul. But baptism is, as mentioned here, a very, a full immersion. Let's go to Acts chapter 8. 
Acts chapter 8, we'll look at 35 and 39. Of course, what we're going to find in Acts chapter 8, 35 and 39 is Philip and the eunuch. Philip is going to be called away to go to the eunuch who is searching throughout the scriptures. He's in Isaiah. He's trying to understand and make sense of what he needs to do in order to be saved. If he's in Isaiah, then you know that he is separated from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. It's not that the Lord's ear is heavy that he can't hear, that his arms are too short that he can't pay, but the eunuch knew that it was his sins and iniquities that separated him from God. And him knowing that he is separated from God, he's trying to figure out how he can be reconciled to hear from Philip. Philip is going to come and sit with him in his chariot, and as they sit, they're going to converse and talk, and they're going to get into a conversation about baptism. We know this because of the question that the eunuch is going to ask. As a eunuch asks this question, he's going to be now that he needs to be baptized, and now how are they, how are they going to get through this out? It's going to be the question. It was understood that when they got to the conversation on baptism, that they understood the terms. It was defined plainly and clearly that baptism was immersed in them. Take a look at Acts chapter 80, verse 35 to 39. It says, Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came into some water, and a eunuch said, See, here's water, which hinders me from being baptized. And Philip said, If you believe, all your heart be made. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is come God. So he commanded the church to stand still. Both Philip and the eunuchs went down into the water, and he baptized him. And he baptized him. Now, when, the, when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way to choice. I know the commonly taught thing is, well, we understand that they needed a, a large body of water in order for him to be fully immersed because we see the fact that it says in the scriptures that he says, well, here is water. That means they came upon some water. It wasn't a matter of them um, just having water, but they came upon some. And then they went down into the water, and then they came up out of the water. But it's considered who he's riding with. He's riding with someone who is a part of the queen's court, Queen Candace of the Ethiopian, someone who's going to have a caravan of people riding with him because he's going to be carrying things of importance, and he himself is someone of importance. This eunuch. So the eunuch is going to be riding in a, a chariot, one that he's not driving because they're going to make it stop. So they're going to have all that they need for travel. They're going to have food, they're going to have water, they're going to have a tent, something they can put up if they need to stop uh, along the way. They're going to have everything possible. You Notice know, that the eunuch doesn't say, I got some water in the back. If you can reach over the back and grab you a scoop without it, you can take care of this baptism right now. He doesn't say that he's sipping on some water because it's the hot day, but you know that people are sprinkling in this, we can take care of this. It was understood that baptism is immersion. Whenever we enter into this conversation about baptism, of course, we're going to talk about the spiritual things and what baptism does and coming in contact with the blood of Christ and washing away our sins, but that cannot happen unless we are fully immersed. If we partially define baptism, you can then move on to define the next word, safe. Every time I have a, a Bible study with someone, the first thing that I do is that I inquire about their, their position, whether or not they are in Christ or outside of Christ. And so the questions I ask is first, uh, have you been baptized? And they'll say, oh yeah, I've been baptized. I was like this old and I was baptized in this place at this time, but okay, that's great. The next question I have is where you say before or after you were baptized. Probably most people say, well, I was saved before I was baptized. I came to the understanding of what I needed to do to be saved. I asked for Jesus to come into my heart and then I was saved. And then the baptism came later. And so we go into the scriptures. Of course, the reason why I ask this is because that ultimately once we get into the scriptures, I will ask them to read. And as they read, I will ask something like, well, what does this say about when salvation comes or when that saved state comes? Something like Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. The order of, of, of operation there is that you are believing, baptized, then saved, not saved, then baptized. So let's take a look at this. But the word saved is defined as saved, to save, that is, deliver or protect, literally or figuratively, heal, preserve, save, do well, to be made or to make whole. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 11 and 12. Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. We're talking about being saved. 
And first, we have to understand what baptism is. That baptism is a full immersion because we are understanding that we are in sin and need to have those sins washed away. So we're going to be fully immersed, going into the water, being washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then, so we now stand in a safe position that we are saved. What exactly do we mean by that? Well, if you are saved, that means you are saved. Acts chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. The verse reads, final verse. I don't have that verse either. Acts chapter 4, 11 and 12 says, This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The important part of this verse is not that very last part that tells us about which we must be saved. We can only be saved by the name of Jesus Christ. We can only be made, we can only be made safe uh, by Jesus Christ. We can only have safety through him. We can only be protected by him, delivered by him, killed by him, preserved through his name. But go back up to that word salvation. We use this word salvation a lot. We interchange salvation and safety, and I'll talk about that more in just a second, but those two words aren't the exact same. If you're going to have salvation, salvation is defined as deliverance from sin and the consequences of. Deliverance from sin and the consequences of. You have been made safe from the sins that you have committed and the consequences following those sins. This isn't talking about an immediate consequence because you sin, there's an immediate consequence that may very well still get you, but at least talking about the eternal consequence of your sin. You have been made safe from that. God has preserved you from that wrath. God has protected you from what has become. You are in a sustained position. If you have been fully immersed, then you have been made safe from your sins. I'm going to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 through 9. If you remember back, as Paul's making his way, building up to the need for salvation, the need for, rather, baptism, he's going to stop in chapter 3 and say, all of y'all have sinned. Then he's going to stop again in chapter 5 and say, even though you've sinned, God still loves you. Then when he gets to chapter 6, this is why God's grace is going to abound. When you sin, you should not need to sin, but it can abound, but you should walk in this life. So he stops here in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, 9. He says, you have been saved. You are made saved. And the reason why is because God loves you, and he's saving you from himself. Take a look at it. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, 9. It says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us much more than Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from his wrath. We shall be made safe from his wrath. I think it's interesting when we talk about the goodness and the severity of God. But we always look at it in the sense that God is all good and he is he's all punishing as well. This is not a bad thing. This is him being perfectly balanced. The goodness and the severity, as good as he will be to those who are faithful, he will be equally severe to those who are wicked. But this is a we are those who are working, but because of him, he is saving us from his own wrath and putting us in a safe, safe position. When you're talking to someone about them being saved, ask them what have they, what have they been saved from. They should understand that they have been saved from the wrath of the very God of them serve because he is the one who is the Lord, but also the one who will punish those that are disobedient. Peter reminds us of such. In 1 Peter 3, verses 20 through 22, 1 Peter 3, verses 20 through 22. Defining the terms matter because if you don't understand baptism, then you can't understand salvation. If you don't understand salvation, then how can you be saved? If you look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 through 22, Peter's going to put all of these things in the forefront and talk about salvation and the fact that we are in a safe position on our way to that salvation because we have been baptized, fully immersed for the remission of our sins. Peter puts these two things together in 1 Peter 3. 20, it says, who were formerly disobedient when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah, while he ought to be prepared, in which of uh, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water, or made safe through water. There is also an ancient type which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the ghost of the flesh, but the answer we did positive towards God. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is now and is and is at the right hand of God, 
angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him. Peter says baptism saves. What he says is immersion makes you safe. Being completely submerged underneath water for the reason of confessing the fact that you was Christ the son of God, that you have sinned against him, that you need to have those sins washed away, that you can't be reconciled, that immersion is then going to put you in a well position, a whole position, a preserved position, a safe position. And all this is done because the answer of a good conscience. Let's go back to this. When we talk about salvation versus safety versus being saved, let's go to first John 2. First John chapter 2. To understand the difference between the two is as simple as understanding, uh, let's just say you're, you're drowning. You're, you're drowning and someone comes and they save you. And when they save you, they pull you back to land and you're now in a safe position. But in order for you to stay in that safe position, they're going to teach you how to swim. They teach you how to swim so that if you ever find yourself again back in those waters, you can get yourself back to that safe position. Now, if you're talking about salvation, you're talking about being in a position to where you can never be in the water ever again. Having salvation at the end of all things, having salvation means that you are in a place that you can only be saved, never to be harmed by the sinfulness of this world or even your own temptation. First John chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3 tell us that I need to teach you how to play. Everybody's going to be in the church as far as their temptation and their sin. They're going to have to find a way out and make their way to safety. Once they get to safety, they want to stay there forever more. And that will come through their practicing of being faithful to God and being faithful to God in the end and have salvation. We'll get there in a second. First John chapter 2. Verses 1, 2, and 3. The verse says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. That if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sin. Let's define propitiation. Propitiation is defined as atonement. He is the atonement for our sins. Atonement is defined as a reconciliation. He is the reconciliation for our sins. Jesus. We should not sin, but if we do sin, we have someone who has atonement for our sins, someone who has reconciled us, even though we have sin. And not for ours only, but also the whole world. By this we know that we know. By this we know that we know him and we keep his commandments. Uh, I feel like I have to say this every time I read this verse. You don't have to say it. It is a choice. I know we get it in our minds that um, every day I have to do this sin. That's just humans. We're humans and every day we have to do this sin. That's not true. Um, the reason why that's not true is because God tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, he's going to give us a way to bear our temptations. He's going to give us a way to escape so that we may be able to bear our temptations, meaning that we never have to engage in sin. We just have to be tempted. We learn in James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, that this is a, of our own making. If you are tempted and you're drawn away, that's from your own lust and desires. But you're drawn away because you're choosing to do so. And then we learn here in 1 John 2, verses 1, 2, and 3, that you're expected not to sin. But if you do, if you do sin, you have an advocate for the Father, a way to have that forgiveness. And you go back up to chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 through 10, he lets us know that if you walk in life, these in life have fellowship one with another, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us continuously. He goes on to say that if you confess your faults, that God is faithful and just to forgive us, you don't have to sin. This is how you stay in a safe position. You want to stay in that safe position safe position until you can receive that salvation in Jesus Christ. Let's go to Romans, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Revelation 2 and verse 10. Maybe the better verse is uh, 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, uh, Paul says that there is laid up for him a crown of righteousness that's going to be given to him by the Lord of righteousness, um, but not to him only, but all those who have loved his appearing. We're, we're wanting to have that. We want to stay in a position of safety until we can sit, until we can sit in a position of salvation. And Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, you shouldn't get lost in the fact that this is written to a very specific audience, but the principle of the matter still applies to everybody. That very last part there, being faithful unto death, applies to all of us. In Revelation 2, and verse 10, he says, Do not fear any of the sins which, are about to, which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. You will have tribulation in days. Be faithful unto that time to give you a common life. That is salvation. 
they need to be able to properly define the term. So if you have been baptized, that means you have been fully immersed for the remission of your sins. This is the answer of a good conscience towards God. If you have made an answer of a good conscience towards God, then you now are standing in a safe position. That does not mean that you will always be in that position because you didn't choose. If you choose to be faithful, you will continue to be safe. If you choose to be unfaithful, then you will depart from the faith. But if you are faithful until death, you will then have salvation. Revelation 2, verse 10. If you have been immersed and you are now saved, then that means that you are now a part of the church. This is something you hear all the time. I was at the gas station last night. I went in for uh, approximately two minutes, bought some chips. I came out, a man waved me down, and I said, I don't, I don't want to talk. It's nine o'clock. I don't know what you're about to say. I don't want to hear. But he stopped me, and I, I stopped, and I, I, I listened to him. And you know what you want to talk about? God. And God slapped me that time. Like, Boy, listen to this. Uh, so I did, and I said, and we talked for like 40 minutes. So he's texting me like, are you okay? Where are you at? I'm like, I'm okay. And so we talked, and we talked, and we talked. And we talked about God, and we talked about the Bible, and we talked about all of these things. But I had to stop him a few times and to define terms. Because what he was saying was what I was saying, but we weren't saying the same thing. When we talk about the church, and I ask him, do you go to church anywhere? Do you live around here? I gave him my car. Hey, I, I preach over at the Church of Christ in Gastonia. Just come and visit. This is my number. Call me anytime. We can have this conversation more in depth. When we talk about church and we talk about the church, what do we mean? What are we saying? Because everybody goes to church. Everybody belongs to some church, even if they're not active in it. Everybody belongs to some religious organization. But what do they mean when they say that? How do they define this term? Church is defined as a calling out that is concretely a popular meeting especially a religious congregation, Jewish synagogue, or Christian community of members on earth, or saints in heaven, or both. Assembly, church. What does the Bible say about this? How does the Bible define church and what the church is? Let's look at it. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. Did you know that back in the, the 40s and 50s, when magazines were all the rage, um, you could get a magazine for 50 cents, you could get a kit, you, you cut out this little section <laughs> and you fill it out and you send it in with your 50 cents and they would send you a build your own church kit. You know, you can do that. Do you know that right now, if you Google how to start a church, they'll give you five steps to start your own church. Isn't that interesting? Uh, the idea that we believe that we could start our own church. Now, planning a congregation in the Lord's church, meaning that we are going to go and preach and teach the gospel, and from that, Christians are going to be created because they are obeying the gospel, and then the body of Christ grows. That's not the same as saying, I'm willing to uh, open up the United Church of Hoogie uh, this morning. If anybody would like to join, the fee is only $500. See me at it if you'd like to be a part of it. First uh, Peter chapter 2, verse 9. What is the church? How do we define that? What does the Bible say that the church is? This is a matter of what we think it is or what we like or what's comfortable to us, but what does God say that the church is? First Peter 2 and verse 9. And, and I want you guys to figure out all these verses that we read. Notice the singularity that's spoken of when it comes to the church. There's not going to be any kind of uh, multiplicity. It's all going to be singular. There's only going to be one that's made mention of it. It's all going to be spoken about in singular terms. And if it is talking about plural, it's talking about many members of one body. That plural you will see. Let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, but you are a chosen generation, a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. So the first thing that the church is, the church is called out. Those who were once in darkness, who were living in sin, those who were once living a life of pleasure that wasn't pleasing to God, but have left that behind to come down into the light that is Jesus Christ. Those who've been called out. So you look at the definition of the church. What is the church? The church is those who were called out of sin and into the light of God. So that we could be those who are light bearers, Matthew 5. Verses 16 and 17, let your life be found for men and experience good works and Lord by your Father who is in heaven. What is the church? The church is called out. What is the church? The church is that in which Christ built the one in which he established. Go to Matthew 16. Matthew chapter 16, 
you know, back in 16, Jesus was questioning about, you know, who people think that I am? Who people say that I am? And they say, well, you know, some say you're John the Baptist, or uh, some say you're Isaiah, you don't want to be prophets. And they say, Jesus said, well, well, who do you think that I am? And they said, well, we believe that you are Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God. Jesus said, I trust out, Simon Bar Jonah, uh, and upon this rock, I'm going to read Matthew 16, verse 18. Matthew 16 and verse 18. What is the church? How do we define that? The church is those who are called out, out of darkness into light. The church is also that which is established by Jesus Christ. He says in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. I've lost my clip, guys. Maybe I just, I don't have any more slides. I'm going to be here. Anyways, Matthew 16, verse 18. It's in your Bible. Promise. Look, it's there. And it's going to say something like this. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I want to point this out that, that doesn't necessarily go with this point. But Jesus makes the point to say, and you are Peter, as if he's trying to separate the two. He makes the point to say that you are Peter. And this is what I believe my church on. This was the confession that you made. And upon that confession, separate and apart from you, I'm going to build my church. One, my church. So, what is the church? This is that in which Jesus Christ has established upon the confession that Peter made that he is the Son of God. I'm going to build my church. How do we define the church? We define the church as his body. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6. Maybe this isn't the verdict if you think about the one to me described in the church as the body of Christ, but this is the perfect way to go to. And really, the first time that we see the church of Christ being made reference to as the body of Christ. If you go back to the end of Acts chapter 8, or excuse me, go to the end of chapter, chapter 8, you're going to see uh, Stephen being stoned. And then the beginning of chapter 9, verses 1, 2, and 3, you see Paul making threats and murders against the church, right? So he's making these threats and murders against the church. Remember, Jesus comes and he meets them. Jesus doesn't say, why are you persecuting the church? Why are you doing this to my people? Why are you hurting them the way that you are? What Jesus says is, why are you doing this to me? The reason why is because the church and the people are one the same, and the church and Christ are one and the same. Take a look at the Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6. We need to find the church as the body of Christ. It says, Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the code. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. I think it's interesting here that Paul doesn't question. I didn't do anything to Jesus. I, I, I'm a Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee. I've been following you my whole life. I've been doing this right by you. I've been in the zeal of persecuting those who I call the Lord against you. I'm a servant of God. He didn't say that I, I've never seen you. I haven't done anything to you. I don't even know you like that. Paul spoke with Jesus and he understood that me persecuting his people is me persecuting him because they are one and the same. The church is the body of Christ. Paul did that without questioning because Paul understood something that he should understand. The body is the church. How do we define the church? We define it as its body. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 18 and verse 24, we see it defined in the very same way. We see the words used interchangeably. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18 says, and he says that if he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Goes on in verse 24, it says, I now rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the affliction of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Lastly, if we're defining the church, we're trying to say what it is. It's the called out, those who are out of darkness into light. It's what Christ established. He said, I will build my church. It is his body. He says, Why are you persecuting me? I am the head of the body, that is the church. But the church is the people. Church is the people. Let's go to Acts 2. Acts chapter 2. 
Uh, you know, whenever I was a kid, although I never, I never was a part of any particular church, like I said before, but my grandma and grandpa were members of the Baptist church. They would take me occasionally. And uh, my parents would say things to me like, uh, don't you go up there and be acting up at the church house? And, you know, I never thought much about the church house, but it is just what it is in buildings. Building is what houses the church. The church is the people, and this building is one that houses. This is the church house, but we are the house. We are the church. The, the pillar of God's truth is we read in First Timothy. It's in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, we see a great view of this the church being the people. God is going to add to the church daily those who are being saved. He can't add to a building because those things don't exist yet. There's no permanent dwelling. There's no place of meeting for the church just yet. The church has just been established on the day of Pentecost and it's grown exponentially and has it grows and is doing so daily. They don't have a central location. If you're looking for us, come and meet me at my office over at the church. It doesn't exist because the church is the people and that is understood. And we should understand the same. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, it says, Pray that God will have favor with all people and the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. When you solicit the prayers of the church, you're looking for the prayers of the people, when you're leaning on the understanding of the church so they can bear your burden, you're leaning on the people, when you're looking to be taken in by the church, you're looking to be taken in by the people, it's not the building that we're in. Colossians chapter 4, verse 15. Colossians chapter 4, verse 15. You can find something very similar to what we're about to read in Colossians 4, verse 15, and finally in chapter 1. Colossians chapter 4, verse 15 says, Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Memphis, uh, and the church that is in his house. Mm -hmm. See how they're separated there? They had a place of meeting, a place where they would go and assemble as they had a place where they would go and worship God collectively, but that place was not the church, but rather they were the church that met inside of this place. Philemon is given the same charge. He says, his greeting, Paul does. Philemon, he says, enter the church that meets in your house. That church is going to be the church of the Philippians. That's the church of the Colossians that meet here in Nemesis' house. Let's end with this. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And if we're talking to someone about church and we're asking them, well, where do you go to church? And they say, well, I go here, I go there. And you say, well, what exactly do you mean by church? And this is where you go and you worship. What, what exactly does church mean to you? And they say, well, church means this to me and means that to me. And they say, well, what does church mean to you? You tell them that church means to you that you are part of the called out. Those who were once in sin and been called out of that darkness into the light of Jesus Christ. You tell them the church means to you that this is what Christ has established. The one that you belong to is the one that he has made. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. If they ask you what church means to you, you tell them the church means that you are the body of Christ. If you chapter 5, you are the bride of Christ. If they say what this church means to you, you tell them that the church is me, the people. First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 says, Come into him, come into him as to a living stone, rejected in the by men, but chosen by God and precious. You are also a living stone. You, you are also as living stones are built up, are being built up, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Timothy tells us that Paul tells Timothy. That he may not be able to come to him, and then he can't be right to stay so that he may know how he ought to conduct himself in the house of God. The pillar of God's like the church is the house of God, and we are the living stones. You want an accurate picture of it? The accurate picture of what the house of God looks like it looks like us being these living stones, it looks like the word of God being our root. We are healed by the word of God, it is our root. It looks like the steps of salvation that gets you to the door that is Jesus Christ. That means that you're going to take the steps to get into this house. That means you're going to hear, believe, repent, confess, and then when you are baptized, you're now going to be in the safe position by way of going through Jesus Christ. John chapter 14, 1 and following, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by him. You should go through that doorway, you now become a part of the church. A living stone is going to build up this body. It's going to build up this house. It is the house of God. If you hear this morning, 
I think here this morning you haven't been properly defining these terms. Maybe what you thought was baptism isn't exactly baptism. Maybe there was a point in time that you were even put underwater, fully immersed, but you did not have a good conscience towards God. You didn't understand you were coming in contact with the blood of Christ, that you were washing away your sins. Maybe before you were just poured or sprinkled. Now is the time for you to get your baptism taken care of properly. Maybe it's the fact that you were baptized before, but you weren't actually saved, and you don't find yourself standing in a safe position awaiting your salvation. That is the case, and you cannot say that you are a part of the church. If you're not part of the church, and you're not part of the body of Christ, if you're not part of that which Christ himself established, you are not one of the people who are part of this royal priesthood, this holy nation, which can't be. I know the day of Easter and the day is the day we're going to recognize and recognize it as it should be. That means that we are recognizing the sacrifice that Christ made and the fact that he resurrected so that we can do the same. If you're here this morning, we have a need to put on Christ in baptism, to resurrect the walking in the sublime, just as our Lord and Savior did many years ago, to make that known as we stand and as we sing. <laughs> It is a lot of gold, it is a lot of gold, it is a lot of gold. 